Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ellie. Nice to see everyone here uh, this morning, getting together to learn a bit of Torah. Always, uh, always a great pleasure. Um, several things I wanted to learn with you today. Some, some, some things a little bit. Uh, uh, the topic of these shurim generally is uh, themes of Sefer Bereshis, and we'll come to that shortly. But uh, since Friday is Asara Batavis. Um, in a couple of days' time. So I thought I'd just learn with you one posuk in Sefer Zechariah, which uh, I think is interesting, and maybe not everyone is aware of. Um, just a bit of background here. The book of Zechariah uh, was written uh, by the Novi Zechariah, but at the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah were bringing the Golos back into Eretz Yisrael what's called Shivat Tzion. Shuv Hashem, as Shivas Tzion, or Yinuk Cholmim, the return to the land of Israel to rebuild the second temple. This was uh, the project which was led by Ezra and Nehemiah, but actually um, it was in the presence of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last three of all the Nevi'im. So in the book of Zechariah, we have a very interesting um, question and answer taking place, which I'd just like to show you for one minute, and then we'll get on with Sefer Bracious. It's, it's a very unusual um, uh, situation where in the Tanakh we find uh, somebody being asked, a Novi being asked a halachic question and giving a halachic answer. Usually we don't associate the Nevi'im with uh, Shilas and Chuvas with questions and answers on the halachic level. But here Zachariah is being asked the following question. And let me give you a bit of a brief intro to this question uh, before, uh, before we look at the Pasuk. The intro is the Jewish people, I want you to imagine the Jewish people had witnessed the Churban Habayas, the destruction of the first temple, the uh, unimaginable tragedy of the destruction of everything they thought was eternal, right? And they were then exiled and massacred, and they find themselves in, in Bovel under the rule of, of Nebuchadnezzar, and they've lost everything. And they've lost everything. They've lost the, the base of Mikdash, they've lost Eretz Yisrael, they've lost er almost everything, but they've still got their Jewish identity and their Jewish leadership. And they've got Yirmi or Hanavi who tells them, don't worry, Within 70 years, we're going to go back to Israel and rebuild the Ba'ez Shani. So they're waiting for this to happen. They go back eventually under Ezra and Nehemiah <coughs> and Zerubovel to rebuild the Ba'ez Shani. And now comes an interesting Shaila. The Shaila is as follows. It seems clear from, this, from the Shaila, it seems clear, or really from the answer, it seems clear that during the time they were in Bovel, uh, the Jewish leadership instituted um, days of Avelut, days of mourning, to mark the Churban. In other words, this was a time, uh, don't forget, just a, a big picture, this was the time of the Anshe Knesset Sagdola. The Anshe Knesset Sagdola introduced many hundreds of new institutions uh, in terms of uh, Jewish life. They institute, instituted really a whole range of what we generally call mitzvahs to Rabbanon, rabbinic Judaism, um, including the text of our Siddur, including the mitzvah of Tefillah B'tzibur, including lots of other halachas which are of rabbinic origin. And one of them was uh, that we need to engage in uh, fast days in our Jewish calendar to, to remember the Churban Habayis, to remember the destruction of the first temple, right? So we see that we, we didn't, we have no record of this before Zachariah is being asked this. We don't have a record in the Tanakh of it. Therefore, this stuff, that's why this question and answer is supremely valuable and is quoted in the Gemara and in the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch and is really the basis of our Ta'anesim, right? We have fast days during the year, all of which are connected to events surrounding the Churban Habayis Rishon, the destruction of the first temple. And the question they're asking Zachariah is a fascinating one. He's, they're saying, okay, we're now standing here back in Yerushalayim. 
the, the dream of the return to Israel has been realized. We now have a, a base of Mikdash, a second temple. What's with all these fast days? Are we now going to continue the fast days and the Avelus for the destruction of the first temple? Or maybe that is now history and we can stop uh, fasting for uh, the first temple because we have, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, uh, um, received permission and ability to rebuild the base of Mikdash. Okay, that's really the context of the post I'm going to show you now. And let's have a look at this just for a moment. This is... Okay, you're going to you're gonna have to bear with me just for one little minute. Okay, let's see how this works. Right, uh, can you see it? Can you see a text? Yes, excellent. A single posseg. I'm not going to go through the whole piece there, but this is Zachariah, the Novi Zachariah who was the, one of the last of all the Nevi'im that ever existed, right? Chagai Zechariah Malachi, and that was it. After that, Malachi says, uh, Malachi says to them, from, that, from now on, there won't any more be any Nevu'ah, no more prophets, until until Eliyahu Hanavi comes to announce the final redemption, there will be no Nevu'ah. So here, this is right, really one of the last moments of Nevoa in Jewish history. So he says, Kei Omar Hashem Tzavakas. So this is a Zechariah quotes saying in the name of God, Tzayim HaRavii V'tzayim HaChamishi V'tzayim HaShavii V'tzayim HaAsiri. So here for the first time we see a list. And when he says Ravii, Chamishi, Shavii and Asiri, he's talking about the months of the year. So if you can follow in the English translation, so Tzom Horavi means the fast, the Ravi means the fast of the fourth month, right? Right, which is uh, Nisan Iya Sivan Tammuz, right? That's the fourth month, it's Tammuz. So the, fourth, the fast of the fourth month is, as I've written here in parenthesis, uh, Shibosa Batamas, the 17th of Tammuz. And the Tzom Hamishi, what is the fast of the, the fast of the fifth month, is uh, Hamishi is Av, right? So that's Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av, and then it is the Tzom, the Tzom HaShavi, the, the seventh month, is what we call Tzom Gedalia, which is the third of Tishri, right? And then you have Tzom HaAsiri, and that is this week, on Friday, the 10th of Tavis. Asara B'Tavis, Tavis is the 10th month of the year. So we see this, this is the real, if somebody ever asks himself, what really is the source? What is the original makar of our fasting on Tisha B'Av, on Shabbos of the Tamas, Tzom Gedalia, and Asar of the so in, in practice, the answer for us is it's written in the Shulchan Aruch. But if you're, if you're a, stu a student of the Shulchan Aruch and you're asking yourself, where did the Gemara, uh, in where, did, where did the Shulchan Aruch get it from? So the answer is the Gemara in Tanis. And then if you look in the Gemara in Tanis, where did they get it from? The answer is this Pasuk. This Pasuk is the Makar for all the Tanesim, all the fasts which we have in our, apart from Yom Kippur, of course, Yom Kippur is in the Torah. But Yom Kippur is the only fast we have in the Chumash. The other Tanesim that we have are not mentioned in the Chumash anywhere. So these are the four, ta four Tanesim which Zechariah is discussing with his uh, questioner. Right? The question is, what, what, what now? Uh, we're now celebrating the Hanukkah's Habayis of the Second Temple, and we're now re-engaging with Eretz Yisrael and Mitzvah Satulius Ba'aretz, so re-engaging with the Kernim and the Leviim and Avodas HaMikdash and the Karbonos, etc. Does it make sense to continue fasting on these days? <coughs> so he says, Koyom HaShem because all these four stuff, four these four Tanesim, Yihye le Beis Yehuda, le Sosain, or le Simcha, or le Mayadim Taiva. All these four days I hereby uh, announce, says Zechariah, that they are transformed into days of Sosain the Simcha. In other words, during the Second Temple period, 
these were four days, they were like mini, mini Yom in Tevim in the Jewish calendar. It's an interesting fact that they were uh, still commemorated. In other words, these four dates did not disappear off the calendar. They were still preserved, but they were like mini, mini, mini Yom in Tevim. I imagine them to be a bit like what we have in our calendar, mini Yom in Tevim, like, uh, like Lag Baoma and Tu Bishvat. Right? They weren't real Yontav in the full sense of the word, but days of, uh, of, Sis, of Sosa and Besimcha. In other words, days where we recalled the sadness of the past, but we said we are now celebrating because we once again have the base of Mikdash. And, uh, uh, but, it, but what we have here in the Pasuk is the first and really only reference in the entire Tanakh to the idea that there were these Ta'anesim instituted um, by the Chachamim of uh, after the Churban, the generation after the Churban, Ezra and Nehemia, and the, the, the group of Chachamim generally referred to as Anshe Knesset Sagdola. And Anshe Knesset Sagdola was a whole group of 120 different Rabbanim over two or three generations, over two or three countries. So, for example, the Gemara says that Doniel, who was living in Bovel, was a member of the Anshikness Sekedola, and Mordechai HaYehudi, who was living in Shushan, in Persia, was also a member of the Anshikness Sekedola. So they were, and then Ezra and Nehemiah, who were then living in Israel. So they were, they were in touch with each, with each other, of course, through uh, WhatsApp. They consulted each other uh, using all uh, modern technology and uh, couriers of one sort or another. And um, so he says, and then he ends up with a classic uh, a statement of the uh, of the Nevi'im, emes v'hasholoim ehovu. But you must love emes and sholom. That was he. He ends up by giving them a little bit of a mini a mini Musa drasha. He says, here, it's true we are here back in Israel, and it's true we've rebuilt the base of Mikdash. And it's true, we don't need to fast anymore for the Churban Habayis, <coughs> because we have again got the base of Mikdash. But you should know that even with Israel and with the base of Mikdash, Ho'enes v'hasholoim ehovu. It's only going to last if you are dedicated to MS and Sholoim. You're going to be MS here, meaning living a, a truthful life, a truthful Jewish life. And Sholoim, Sholoim meaning uh, peace with each other. So here's Zachariah. This is a, a beautiful classic posuk um, of, uh, of the Nevi'im. So he gives them a psak halacha, which is a bit of a revolutionary psak halacha. He's saying, look, you know, we instituted these Tanesim. We're now suspending these Tanesim. As long as there is a second, second temple, we don't need to fast anymore. But for the last 2,000 years, since the destruction of uh, the second base of Mikdash, these Tanesim returned uh, to us as Tanesim. So please God, on Friday, we're going to be uh, fasting uh, to commemorate the Churban Habayis Rishon, and indeed also the Churban Habayis Shani, because during the time of the Second Temple, th these were not uh, fast days anymore, right? They're technically, I don't want to spend the whole shir on Asara Batavis. Asara Batavis is the only one of these fast days which can happen on a Friday. Um, and it's a bit strange to have a Tanis uh, on a Friday and to go into Shabbos uh, fasting. It's actually the, the only, op it's the only case of its kind in the whole of the Jewish calendar. And why that is and how it is, that's a subject for a separate Shia. I'm not gonna go into that um, for the moment. But I think it's important to know, uh, you know, for people who are able to fast, it's a mitzvah to fast, and even for people who are not able to fast for whatever reason it is, it's important to realize that the day itself has its origins uh, two and a half uh, thousand years ago in the writings of the Tanakh, in the lives of Ezra and Nehemiah and, and Haggai, Zachariah and Malachi. And, and it was to commemorate the sadness and, and the difficulties um, that Klai Yisrael went through. Interesting, he says, for Emes Vashal that he, he says, he, he understood already Zachariah that this second temple is only going to survive as long as there is MS and Sholem. These are like the two primary values that Zachariah teaches throughout the entire book of Zachariah, which is the most beautiful 
uh, a book of, of, of prophecies and ideas. Uh, MS and Shalom. MS for him means leading a, a life which is truthful to God and truthful to Jewish tradition and, and Torah and mitzvahs. And Shalom means peace, internal peace, peace within, within uh, uh, Klal Yisrael. Okay, that's it. That's our Sarah Bateves. A little bit of a, uh, uh, we're still working on both MS and Shalom, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this day, right? Uh, we are a couple of thousand years later, and we're still working on trying to sustain uh, MS as a Jewish life and Shalom uh, to try and combat uh, hatred, sinas chinam, hatred, and, and various different internal fightings uh, within Klal Yisrael. It's for that reason, incidentally, that I sincerely hope we do not have another election shortly, because in this country, election time is always a, a, uh, a spectacular feast of hatred and hostility and accusations. And, and uh, it, it's a very, very, every, every, every time we have the pre-election weeks are for me always heartbreaking to hear what people say about each other and the accusations and the names and the, the hostility is just really, really something unbelievable. And, and uh, I'd like to share with you maybe, if you'd like just as an aside, a little, a little spark of light here on the, in, in this field. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have uh, picked up recently. Now, I, I don't usually mention in Torah Shiurim um, new songs that have come out on the charts, on the, on the, on the pop, pop music, uh, uh, sort of uh, culture. It's not really my um, my field, and not really my not really my, my my interests, and not really something to teach. But last week or so, I'm not sure exactly when it came out, but in the last week or so, a, a new uh, a song came out, and there was something really new and interesting about this song, which I'd like to share with you for two minutes. And if you have a chance, make a note of the name of the guy and the song, and Google it. And, and, and check it out yourselves, right? So uh, for many years now, so I'm, so I'm led to understand, uh, one of the leading uh, singers and activists in the uh, world of Israeli rock music, who is a very, I would say, a militant, atheist, anti-religious, anti-establishment, and, and, and anti anything sacred and anything uh, traditionally Jewish, is a fellow called Aviv Geffen, who is actually the son of someone called Yonatan Geffen, who was even worse. Okay, but let's speak about the son for a second, Aviv Geffen. So he's a major singer. He does rock concerts where thousands of Israeli kids come, and he's a, bit, he, he's a real rock star in Israel. He came out with a song a few days ago, I think maybe a week or two ago, I'm not sure exactly when, if I'm not mistaken, the song is called Batsoret. Batsoret means a famine, right? And he decided, listen to this, to sing this song to it together as a duet, together with Avram Fried. Okay, so you've probably heard of Avram Fried, right? Avram Fried is one of the most uh, famous uh, uh, Haredish uh, Hasidic uh, song composers and singers um, of the last decade. And Avram Fried joined up with Aviv Geffen. Even that one sentence in my mind uh, is, is very, very uh, <laughs> in incomprehensible. To have Aviv Geffen and Avram Fried on the same label singing together in duet. And they're singing, we are in a time of Batsoret. We're in a time of famine. And he's speaking about Corona era. And Kulanu Achim, we are all brothers. It's enough of the hatred. It's a time to see each other as all brothers. And I must tell you, listening to this song and looking up a bit of what Aviv Geffen has been saying recently has been for me a real tiny, the tiniest glimmer of hope of somebody who is not famous for being a great thinker or a great uh, Jewish, uh, identifying with any Jewish values at all that I'm familiar with. And nevertheless, he has decided, so he, he gave an interview a couple of months ago on Israeli television, where he said he suddenly realized, he said that his whole life, he's been taught to hate the Datiyim. And it's finished, it's time to stop that now, he said. It's time to stop that. It's time to stop teaching hatred and to start teaching and to start singing songs about how we can all live together 
we have we have our differences and I haven't changed my mind, he says, about any of the things that I believe in or don't believe in, but let's live together as brothers in, in a brotherhood. And this, I think, is a quite an extraordinary, quite an extraordinary uh, uh, move in this, man's, in this man's life. I don't know enough about him or his private life in order to uh, <coughs> say anything at all about how he has come to this new, um, new uh, amazing uh, um, uh, conclusion. Um, but uh, the idea that Kulano Achim is something that in the, in, the, in the Jewish world, in the Torah world, we try very hard, many of us try very hard to emphasize and teach all the time, but coming from the very hard left, coming from the very hard uh, Chiloni world, a real somebody who has his whole life, his life and his father's life and his family have always announced themselves as classic Chilonim and atheists and anti-religious in the, in, in the most extreme sense possible, to hear him sing a song with Avram Fried about Kulanu Achim, we are all brothers. So I thought maybe that the message of Zachariah Hanovi two and a half thousand years ago, for her MS for Sholo in Ehovu, made that we should try, try and love uh, peace and try and love a little bit of, of, of coexistence and live and let live. Um, in an interview, he said he was particularly angered by the way the Chiloni world were in, in the coronavirus early months were speaking against the Datiyim and against B'nai Brak and, and, and the venom of it and the hostility of it really, he said, changed my whole life perspective. I can't live in a group of people who live with hatred. You can't live with hatred. Anyhow, this is just a little bit of good news. One is allowed occasionally uh, in, in, to speak about some good news. And so this is a little spark of good news from a very um, unexpected source. Get onto YouTube, put in Aviv Geffen and Avram Fried and listen to a song, right? Where they give you the words on the screen of Batsoret. And I don't get any commissions incidentally, but I, it only went up two or three days ago. So it says on YouTube, it only went up on YouTube two or three days ago. It's already got about 80,000 people have listened to it. So it's, it's, it's considered to be uh, one of the new, uh, one of the amazing <coughs> events uh, of, of recent times. And maybe ho hopefully it's a, a, a sign of good things, good things to come. Maybe something good came out of 2020 uh, in, this, in this area, uh, we don't know. Okay, that's it. That, that's enough about that. So I've told you about Asara Batavis, and I've told you about Aviv Geffen, a very unusual combination. I don't think anybody ever in the history of Jewish learning has combined Aviv Geffen with Zachariah Hanovi uh, before. So this is a novel, a novel combination that we've heard uh, today in this year, and I'm pleased to be able to uh, to share it with you. <coughs> But it's interesting, Zachary from the very beginning says that Sholoim, having inner peace among Klal Yisrael, is the key to this second temple. And the truth is that Chazal say that the second temple was destroyed because of Sinas Chino, because they lost the internal harmony within Klal Yisrael, because of the hatred between different groups of Jews. That was the key trigger, if you like, for the destruction of the second base of Mikdash. So it's certainly something worth thinking about on Asara Batavis. Uh, I give you a special heta uh, to listen to this song on Asara Batavis uh, and, and reflect reflect on the idea uh, that Avram Fried. I don't think there'd be many Frum singers who'd be willing ever uh, to, to, to join Aviv Geffen on a label. But Avram Fried is already a legend and he doesn't need to worry about his reputation. He's uh, well enough established that he can sing with anybody. Um, and uh, but I think that was just uh, something most extraordinary. Okay, let's put that aside for a moment. Let's get back to Sefer Bereshis. <laughs> so in Sefer Bereshis, uh, we are now uh, Parshas uh, Vayigash, right? So Miketz and Vayigash are, are two uh, parshias which are very, very uh, uh, closely uh, connected. Those of you who are following uh, the Kriya Satora on Shabbos morning, we'll know that Miketz actually ends in the middle of a drama. In fact, one can hardly wait 
for the next installment because the tension, it's a, uh, Miketz ends on a, on a cliffhanger, right? Binyamin has been accused of theft and Yosef has not revealed himself yet. He is still masquerading as the uh, a viceroy of Egypt. And he says, that's it. Binyamin has stolen my goblet, uh, the royal goblet, and he will be a slave for the rest of his life. The rest of you can go free. The rest of you can go free. And, the, and, and the, all the other brothers suddenly realize that they are in a totally impossible situation because there's no way that they can return to, <clears throat> no way that they can return to Yaakov without Binyamin with them. Right? That is, that is, so they've reached an impasse. They can't take Binyamin and they can't leave Binyamin. And they're stuck in the middle and it, it looks like the end of the family. It looks like well, that's it, it's finished. They can't go back to their father. They can't leave Binyamin. What are they going to do? And the answer is, by Yigash Elov Yehuda, the opening, the opening 17 verses of this week's Parsha, by Yigash, is one of the most famous uh, speeches in the whole Chumash, right? But Yehuda steps forward, and it's Dafke Yehuda, because Yehuda has taken over leadership of the Jewish people. Yehuda is Malchus, Gur Arya Yehuda, Yehuda represents the, the leadership. But Yigash means to step up, to step up to the plate and decide he's going to solve this problem. And he gives this impassioned speech. And this speech changes Yosef's mind. Right? Once Yosef has heard this speech, Yosef now changes his mind and he reveals himself and he reconciles himself with his brother. And the question I'm going to look at is... <coughs> What was really the, the key point, right? What was really the key point which uh, Yehuda said, which changed Yosef's mind? And this is an interesting thing. The whole of these, these parashas deal with this internal uh, um, jealousies, hatreds, misunderstandings, misjudgments. The brothers and Yosef is actually um, a tragic, a tragic story. But in Parshas by Yigash, it is resolved. How is it resolved? Here's the question. Right? So the answer is it's resolved by a, a, a brilliant interplay between Yosef and Yehuda. And you have to understand this a little bit at, at a deeper level. Yosef and Yehuda between them find a solution to this problem. Let me explain to you what's going on here. So when we read the Parsha, we read... Uh, that Yosef really uh, manipulates his brothers, right? He dresses up, he pretends to be someone that he isn't, and, and he accuses them of all sorts of things, and eventually uh, uh, accuses Binyamin and says, I'm going to take Binyamin and the rest of you can go free. And the question really is, what did Yosef think that he was doing? What was Yosef's goal in manipulating the brothers and, and uh, creating such a difficult situation uh, for his family. Um, a second interesting question is, uh, Yosef, just to get the dates right, so Yosef is 17 when he sold as a slave. That's what the Apostle says. And then the next Apostle says later on that he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. So Yosef was 13 years in prison. He was in prison for 13 years. And then, and then it says that, the, that um, when the brothers come to him uh, to begging for food, um, it was the second year of the famine. So if you have seven years of plenty and two years of famine, so that's nine years later, right? right? So it's 13 years as a slave plus nine years later. So it's 22 years. He, ha he hasn't seen his father for 22 years. All this is in Russia. Rashi says he hasn't seen his father for 22 years. But here's an interesting question. The Kaliyoko, the Ramban, asked this question. The last nine years, he's been a very powerful man in Egypt. And he knew, he must have known, that his father Yaakov is sitting at home back in Israel, and he is in deep avelut, right? He's in mourning, that he's lost his beloved Yosef. In such a way, in fact, that Rashi says that because of his sadness, he had lost his Ruach HaKodesh. 
right? In this week's parsha in, in Bayigash, when he hears Old Yosef Chai, that Yosef is still alive, the Apostle says, but Ruach Yaakov Aviyem, that Yaakov's Ruach returned to him, says Rashi, for 22 years, he, he didn't have Ruach HaKodesh, he didn't have his spiritual uh, uh, power, his spiritual energy, because of his sadness, because he was so deeply in, uh, uh, um, enveloped by the sadness of the loss of Yosef. Yosef must have known that his father was mourning for him, so why didn't Yosef send a man on a horse with a letter to his father saying, hi, dad, this is Joe. I'm alive and well. Don't worry. I'll see you soon. Love, Joseph. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he relieve his father of Avelus for the last nine years? Right? I would have. You would have. Right? You would have thought, gosh, I must, I must... Uh, I must reassure my father that I'm still alive. Who knows what he thinks has happened to me? And he doesn't. So here comes a real, you have to delve a little bit into Yosef's mind. Yosef was a brilliant strategist. And we find that time and time and again, he's got a brilliant, to Paro, for Paro, he, he gives him a whole strategy for the economy of the entire empire, how to, how to manage it. He knew exactly how to, how to work things out, the strategy of it. So Yosef also had a strategy for the family. He said his main goal was to find a way to reunite the family. The family had been broken. By selling Yosef, the family was broken up. And going forward into the next generation to, to build up Am Yisrael, you needed a united people. He knew there was Am Yisrael. He knew there was... Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov were the others of Am Yisrael, and, and he knew there was a, 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 a goal of creating a special people. But for that, you had to have a united family. How is he going to unite the family? And the answer is, he's only going to do so, this is the Malbim. What I'm telling you now is really pretty much what's written in the Malbim. It's only going to happen if the brothers do tshuva, if they do a real repentance, a real tshuva, for having sold Yosef. If they come to see the error of their ways, they come to realize they did an Avera, and they do real tshuva. Now, in, in the laws of tshuva, if you have a look in the Rambam, in the second chapter of Hilkos Tshuva, the Rambam says, what is the ultimate sign of having done tshuva? So tshuva, of course, is in the heart. You know, you have to regret what you've done wrong and resolve to be better and say a vidui, and that's tshuva. But there sometimes is an ultimate opportunity to demonstrate one, what the Rambam calls tshuva gemura. Says the Rambam, how do you ever demonstrate that you've done tshuva? Says the Rambam, if you have an opportunity to do exactly the same mistake again, a second time round, and you decide not to, because you've done tshuva, that's it. That is the, that is, you, you demonstrated that you have done tshuva on the original Avera because you could have done it again. And the fact that you've chosen not to do it again, that and only that, says the Rambam, is the real demonstration of tshuva. This is all in the Malbim. So the Malbim says that Yosef wanted to create, a, if you like, a reenactment. How is he going to reenact the sale of Yosef? The answer is the sale of Binyamin. He's going to create a situation where the brothers are faced with abandoning Binyamin in order to save themselves. Are they going to abandon Binyamin in order to save themselves? If they don't, then they've done tshuva. If they say, we are standing by him, come whatever happens, we're not letting go of Binyamin, then that's tshuva. And that's what Yosef wanted to hear. He wanted to hear that there was going to be a, that there was a tshuva, that, the, that, that his brothers were now thinking differently. Okay? So this is, and that's really why he didn't send a message to his father, because there was no point sent, so long as the family was, was disunited, right? The, the, the family was disjointed and fragmented. There was no point in sending a message to his father, because his father would only really uh, be happy if he saw a united family. If, he saw, if, if the family continued to be fragmented, then there was no future at all. So he didn't want to give his father momentary uh, uh, happiness, 
by, by sending him a letter, but he was still alive, when he knew that really he hadn't solved the problem at all. So he wanted to solve the big problem. So he created this whole situation, the whole situation of the brothers coming and, and Binyamin being accused was a setup, right? Binyamin was set up uh, to be accused of stealing the goblet. But the chokhmah behind this was, would they do tshuva or not? And with that in mind, you have to read uh, the, the first 17 psukim of Parshish by Yigash and listen carefully to what Yehuda is saying. And then you will see there's one word, just one word in the 17 psukim oration of Yehuda, which presses the button uh, with, with Yosef. There's one word which makes all the difference. Let's see if we can look at some text just for a few minutes. One second. Okay, the power of Yehuda. Everybody with me? Can you see the text? Yes? The key word, right? So in order to understand the key word, you have to go back to last week's Pasha, where Yaakov says to his brothers, there's no way I'm sending Binyamin with you. I've already lost Yosef, and my beloved wife Rochel only gave me two children, Yosef and Binyamin. I've, only lo I've already lost Yosef. I'm not going to lose. If I lose Binyamin, my life is finished. So the brothers said, But wait a minute. If we don't bring Binyamin back with us, we won't get any food. We'll starve to death. Yaakov seems to be saying, I don't care. I'd rather starve to death than lose Binyamin. He's not willing to let him go. And at that point, Yehuda steps forward. So we find Yehuda at the beginning of Ayigash, but that's really stage two. The first time that Yehuda steps forward to take a leadership role is with his father. Vayomer Yehuda, El Yisrael Aviv. Yehuda says to his father, Shulcho Hanar Iti, send the boy in my care. That's how I've translated it here. Send the boy send the boy in my care. That's what he's saying. <coughs> the boy, of course, he... I apologize. I usually remember to switch off my phone, but this morning I didn't remember to switch it off. Okay, it's now off. It's now on, on the flight, uh, flight mode. Okay, so Yehuda says, send the boy in my care. Let's go back to Mitzrayim to get food. And that way we will live and we will not die, you and we and our children. You and us, probably it should be. You and us and our children. Right? You and us and our children. Okay. But so far, Yehuda hasn't said anything new at all. He's just begging. He's begging his father, please send him. But now comes the real crunch point in this whole story. And now he says, Onochi Erven. Onochi Erven. What does that mean? Onochi Erven. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody know what, what in, in, in Hebrew, in both in Talmudic Hebrew and in modern Hebrew, there is, in, when you come to a contract, there is the concept of an orave. What is an orave? Anybody know what an orave is? Guarantor. A guarantor. Thank you. I see that Phil is quick off the mark. An orave is a guarantor. If you want to rent a property, for example, and you sign a lease, the owner of the property wants a guarantor, wants somebody to sign underneath your name. In the, in the event that you disappear owing him money, he's got an address to go to. A guarantor is a very, very powerful mechanism in monetary documents. And an orave is someone, what is an orave really saying? An orave is saying, <coughs> I'm willing to put all my assets on the line to guarantee what this man has, has signed. This man has signed a document. I'm guaranteeing him. To be an RA was an extremely powerful idea, right? And in actual fact, this idea has been, if you like, uh, uh, magnified by Chazal in the phrase, Kol Yisrael Aravim Zelozet that we are all mutually obligated for each other. 
In other words, we shouldn't see each other as a group of individuals, but as a group of people who are connected by mutual, mutual arevut, to be an orev is something extremely powerful. It says Yehuda, Onochi Ervin. I will get personally, you know what, what Yehuda is saying is, so long as I'm alive, he will be alive. I'm putting my life on the line, says Yehuda, in order to make sure that Benjamin comes back to you. And interestingly, if you look in last week's parsha, as soon as Yehuda says that, Yaakov says, okay, take it and we'll go. Now, words, that was the key turning point in the whole drama between Yaakov and the brothers. And suddenly Yaakov feels, okay, if Yehuda is willing to take on that arevus, that promise of guarantee, then that makes a whole different, then we're in a different world. We're now in a different world. We're in a world where one brother has guaranteed another brother. I just want to say to you in passing that uh, I saw quoted, that somebody brought down that in, in the Zohar, I'm myself not a student of the Zohar, but I, it is quote cited by other Mephoshim. And apparently in the Zohar is written that when Yehuda said, Onochi Ervenu, I will be an ore for my brother. This was a tikkun. This, in some sense, on a, on a cosmic level, this was a remedy to a statement that had been made earlier in history between two brothers. Anybody got any idea what I'm referring to? There was a statement made between two brothers earlier in the, in the Chumash, which is the mirror image of Onochi Ervenu. Anybody know? Who, who, who said that? Uh, it was me, Danny. Danny, you're, 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 you're a voice without a face uh, for my screen, but thank you. Yes, the, the Kayin said about Evel, Hashomer Ochi Onochi, am I my brother's keeper? The most terrible statement to make. That statement is almost as terrible as the actual crime that he committed. Now, as he's saying, look, my brother's welfare is, means nothing to me. I, am I my brother's keeper? My brother means nothing to me. I'm myself, and he's himself. Right? What Chazal call midas sedoi. Shali, shali, v'shelcha, shelcha. I live my life, you live your life, and if you're starving to death, please die quietly in the corner. Don't make a mess. Don't disturb me. It's got nothing to do with me at all. That's midas sedoi. Shali, shali, v'shelcha, shelcha. And that's Kayin saying, Hashoma Ochi Onochi, comes along Reuve, and he makes in, in the world, in the, in the human world, he creates a new value, which has never been said before, which is Onochi Ervenu. I will guarantee my brother. My life is on the line. And everything I've ever gotten done in my life is on the line to guarantee the safety of my brother, and that's it. This is, I'm, this is not negotiable. I'm, I'm the orev. I'm a total orev for my brother. But as soon as Yaakov heard that, he realized that these, boy, that these sons of his were really <clears throat> people he could rely on. He could rely on. They weren't separate individuals. Onochi right? Erevenu. Comes along, okay, now let's fast forward to this week's parsha of Ayigash. So, so uh, um, the parsha is by Yigash in, in uh, this week's parsha. So Yehuda's in the middle of his speech to Yosef. And Yosef is not moved by any of this. He said, so far Yehuda simply said, please, please, we have an older father. And if I don't bring Binyamin back, he will be terribly, he'll die of grief. That's what he says here in this passage. For Hoyo Kiroso. If my father sees us coming back without Binyamin, he will die of grief. And it'll be your fault, he says to Yosef. Save us that my father's death will be. He will descend to death in sadness simply because he's lost Yosef. And now look what he says here. And now he tells Yosef this chiddush of his. Don't forget, Yehuda has a chiddush. 
Onochi Erevenu was a chidush, was something no one ever heard before. He tells the Yosef, guess what? Ki avdecha orav eshana, orav. He says, I, when he says avdecha, your servant, he means me. I, Yehuda, your servant, what have I done? I have pledged myself for this, son, for this boy. I made myself an orav to this boy. Right? May im avi, vis-a-vis my father. Lema saying, I'll be guilty for you forever, says Rashi, in other words, he was completely committed. He says, I, be, I made myself an orate. You can't do this to me. And if you look at this week's, if you listen to this week's laning carefully, you will find that Yehuda makes this whole passionate plea. Please, he's begging for mercy for Yosef. Please let the boy go. I'll give you all sorts of things. I, I personally will be your slave. I'm a much better slave than him. I'll be your slave instead of him. Let him go back to my father. We will do anything absolutely possible to, to let Binyamin go. <coughs> and it seems that Binyamin is unmoved by all this. But as soon as Yehuda says, I made myself an orave, at that point, Yosef reveals himself and reconciles to the family. Why? Because Yosef realizes that this was the tshuva. This was the tshuva of the brothers. The brothers had done tshuva. All he'd been looking for all along was a sign that they had done tshuva. Right? That's what I said to you before. The Malbim explains the whole setup. Everything had been only designed. The brothers should recognize the error of their ways in selling Yosef. And do tshuva for it. What was the tshuva? Onochi oravti eshana. That I have pledged myself for the well-being of Binyamin, and that was the key. And that's a, it's a very interesting thing. So this is the key word, both in uh, Miketz and in Vayigash. Right? The turning point is the concept of aravus, of aravim zelozeh. And that's why this is such a, a, a fabulous story. Because you see Yehuda, he convinces Yosef, inadvertently, he doesn't realize that the person he's speaking to is Yosef. He doesn't realize that Yosef is waiting to hear a word of tshuva. But the word, ani oravti as hana, that I made myself an orif, that does, uh, that does the trick. And Yosef, then he reveals himself, he hugs them, and he tells them, don't worry, everything is fine, we'll work it all out together. And that's the beginning of, of the reconciliation and the unity of the family, and then immediately he says to them, and now's the time to go back to your father and tell him, oh dear Safra. Now you can tell him. He did nine years ago, the last nine years, there was nothing to tell him. Because it's true, it was nice that Yosef was still alive, but what has he achieved? The family is still fragmented. Now that we are reunited, tell my father, there is a future. The family is reunited and Yosef is alive. And this is a very powerful, powerful idea. And I'd like to add to this, two very interesting observations of Jewish history. Now, within the Jewish history of the Tanakh, we find that Yehuda and Benjamin are bound together in the most powerful way possible of all the tribes of Israel. Yehuda and Benjamin have a very, very special Keshesh or Kayama. They've got an absolutely unbreakable bond between them, which was created in this week's parsha, more accurately in last week's parsha, when Yehuda says Onochi Ervenu, at that point the whole destiny of Yehuda and Binyamin are intertwined with each other in a way which is unimaginable. And I'll give you two examples for it. You know that the land of Israel is divided up among all the twelve tribes, right? Reuben's got his bit, Shimon's got his bit, Levi, everyone's got their own bit. Levi doesn't get a piece of land, but he gets Ore Levium. He gets cities of Levium scattered all around the country, right? Let me ask you a question. The Har Habayis of Yerushalayim, in whose area was the Har Habayis? So the, anyone know? Uh, anyone know? The, in your mind. Okay. Half in your mind, half Yehuda. That's right. Half in your mind. Phil has been doing his homework. The, the, the Har Habayis, says the Gemara and Zvachim, that the Har Habayis was half of it was Binyamin and half of it was Yehuda, right? 
because Binyamin, the actual Ohel, as I understand the Gemara there, it's a bit complicated. The Ohel there was, had to be Binyamin, right? You did Hashem, Yishka, and Lovetach, Olov, right? And that was the, the, the Shechina was in the, in the part of Binyamin, but the Lishkas Hagazis, where the Sanhedrin lived, had to be in the tribe of Yehuda because he was uh, uh, um, Shevet Yehuda or Mechokek. He was the Mechokek. He was in charge of the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin and the base of Mikdash were were right next to each other on the top of the Harabais, and that was Yehuda Binyamin. So the border between Yehuda Binyamin went right through the Harabais. So Yehuda Binyamin were joined by the Harabais, and that's the most powerful Kesher. In the whole geographically, in the whole country, between any two pieces of land of any two tribes, and what where does that originate? That connection at on the Har Habayis, that originates from this week's parsha, Onochi or Rafti as Hanar. When he said that, then for all future history, Yehuda bin Yomin were destined to be really completely united in every possible way. And the Harabais really is one sign of that unity. But let me give you another sign. <coughs> we all know there were, tri- there were tribes, 12 tribes of Israel, right? And we all know that the, at the end of, of, of the Bayez Shemi period, that uh, the, uh, there was an invasion of Ashur, of Assyria, and they took 10 tribes into exile. Right? Famous, uh, the lost 10 tribes. So let me ask you a question. After the ten drives be taken into exile, who was left? Which were the two that were left? Yehuda and Binyamin. Yehuda and Binyamin. Yehuda and Binyamin. Between them, they represented the entire future of Jewish history. After the ten tribes were taken into exile and sadly were lost and assimilated into into the Assyrian Empire, the only two tribes that really created the future of the Jewish people was Yehuda ben Yomin. And, 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 and there again, you find Yehuda ben Yomin are linked together in this most amazing, most amazing way, right? Uh, and to this day, you know, if you look at the map of Israel today, you find Yehuda, the area of Yehuda is the whole area south of Jerusalem, and the area of ben Yomin is the whole area north of Jerusalem, right? And the, the border is on the Harabah. Right, Hebron and Gush Etzion and everything is all called Hare Yehuda. Is all the Yehuda area, and north of Israel is in Binyamin. Right, uh, uh, north of Jerusalem is all Binyamin, and and those two between them were the future of the Jewish people. Right? But what created that Kesher? What, what created it was Yehuda saying, "O Nochi Ervenu Miyodi Tvachem." This is a very powerful idea. I think a central theme, really. If we're looking for central themes in Sefer Barashas, one of the central themes is creating this new idea, this all-important idea of mutual responsibility, of and in particular, uniting together Yehuda bin Yamin in such a way that forever, both geographically and historically, they're never, they're never separated again. So most of us, ladies and gentlemen, we are all from Yehuda, or Binyamin, right? Incidentally, there, there were, of course, certain tribes, so certain cities of Ore Levim, cities, so, so we do have some Kohenim and Levim as well. And there probably are some small amount of, uh, because the Chazal say that Yirmiyah Hanavi went into the empire of Ashur and brought back some of the 10 tribes into the land of Israel. We don't know how many, we've no numbers or anything like that at all, and we've lost track of these things. But certainly, the, the hard core of the future of the Jewish people after the uh, Assyrian invasion going forward was all uh, Yehuda and Binyamin, and that partnership was created by Yehuda's sense of responsibility. So there you have it, uh, something very fascinating. In, in Sefer Bereshis, one of the Yisodas, one of the principles of Jewish life was this uh, Arevus, Aravim Zelozer, the idea of responsibility for each other, the idea of being concerned about the, 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 the well-being of fellow members of Klal Yisrael, 
um, something which to us may be, we consider it obvious, but it's only obvious to us because we've had it in our, in our Jewish life uh, for the last 3,000 years because Yehuda said this. Only because Yehuda said this, this idea became central uh, to Jewish life. And one of the, um, uh, incidentally, if you look in Rashi, at the very, very end of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, so Rashi Mashi, uh, will tell you that in the last day of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, he does something interesting. He makes Klal Yisrael undertake a bris, a covenant. Atem nitzovim hayom kulchem nifnei Hashem lakeichem, right, etc., etc. Ovracho bivris. What was the covenant that Moshe Rabbeinu made the Jewish people accept in the last day of his life? It's not clear from the Psukim what this bris was about, because the bris of the bris Mila they already had from Avram Avinu, the bris of Matan Torah they had from Sinai, right? And the, the other, what, what bris is this? What's, what is the content of this covenant? So Rashi says in Parshas Nitzavim, he says this is the last day of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, and he understands that going forward, Kalal Yisrael need to make one final covenant with Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and that is. Kol Yisrael Arevim Ze'ozeh. That's the covenant. Covenant is a covenant of mutual responsibility to be concerned about the physical and spiritual welfare of fellow Jews. That is the secret of the success of the future of the Jewish people. And that's the final covenant in the Chumash. There are several different covenants in the Chumash. But the last one is Kol Yisrael Arevim Ze'ozeh. And if you look in Rashi, Rashi says this is particularly connected to the land of Israel. Rashi says Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't do this earlier because they didn't yet have the land of Israel, but he knew that within a few days they were going to enter the land of Israel, and the land of Israel will create a situation where this Kali Yisrael, Arevim Zelazer, the mutual responsibility for the well-being of the rest of Kali Yisrael, will become the central crucial issue. And that's what Zechariah meant, coming back to the opening line of the Shia, that's what Zachariah meant when he said, by MS, by Shalom, that Shalom between members of Klal Yisrael, which not everybody feels all the time, or not everybody is aware of, and sadly, we've got so many fragments, I don't know, Hasidim and Misnagdim and Svaradim and Ashkenazim and Belzers and Satmas and Chabadskas and all sorts of different groupings. We, are, we seem to be experts in dividing up uh, like amoeba in, into into more and more different uh, groupings. But at the end of the day, all these different groupings have to have an arrivus to each other. And in recent days, even Aviv Geffen has cottoned on to this particular idea. Even, even the most unlikely person on planet Earth to get up and say, Kulanu Achim, we are all brothers. We may disagree on certain things, but even when we disagree, we have to preserve the brotherhood. This idea began in Pasha's Miketz uh, Vayigash um, uh, uh, with Yehuda, and, and that's the secret, really, of the strength of Klal Yisrael. That's it, Rabbi Sai. That's it for today.